Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is my vlog for the 28th of January, uh, 2017. Um, for this, I thought I would start with talking a little bit about Wikipedia and my experience with it, and then I'll, uh, I'll talk about a few other things that I have queued up. A long time ago, uh, I, was, uh, in, I was pretty heavily involved in Wikipedia and very, very lightly involved with its uh, predecessor. Um, I remember joining the uh, uh, joining the effort to start building uh, a start building an encyclopedia. I mostly just lurked on the email lists initially. I wasn't sure if it was going to take off, and it wasn't clear what kind of help they needed. Um, and eventually, both of the founders uh, went with a rather different model than what they described, and. Uh, and I kind of stepped back for a little while at that point. I was still doing Usenet moderation and a few other public service-y things. I think I came back in uh, sometime around 2002 and just started editing. And it turned out to be kind of addictive just because I enjoy the process of organizing information Something about it just, it appeals to people like me, maybe because I have occasionally uh, done teaching. Uh, I've taught people how to program, and uh, just the idea of organizing information, fussing over how to present it, it's, it's neat. And I, I, I keep, I have plenty of my own efforts along these lines, and that I've worked with stories. I did a webcomic. Uh, actually, I did a few webcomics for a while, probably nothing that you would have ever heard of. Um, but, but Wikipedia, it slowly became uh, something that I would spend, uh, spend a lot of time on. And the more that you do that, the more likely it is that you'll eventually get into conflicts with other people, and you have to figure out how to resolve them. And... Wikipedia, is, it has experiments within it on how societies can organize themselves without strong central authority and with fairly loose rules. And you find that like there, plenty of people enter into that with various types of idealism that doesn't work in practice, but occasionally uh, things do work, and the things that work, they stick, uh, even if they only kind of work. And you kind of, as a community, provided that you don't run into issues that destroy the community or destroy the project, you eventually kind of figure it out. And I think, like, governments tend to work this way, and really any human social organization tends to work this way. You can look over your fence at what neighboring projects did and maybe grab some ideas from them. Uh, and so Wikipedia, it, it grew these... Uh, it, it coalesced around a certain set of ideals and grew structure uh, and kept on growing structure as more people joined the project and as the project expanded to focus on more topics. And so I got involved in the politics of it for a while. Uh, I think it was sometime around 2007 or 2008 that eventually, after fairly long involvement in what was getting to be a fairly civilized, structured uh, community with a lot of like inner circles and outer circles and people who had put a lot of commitment into it, uh, who would end up making decisions and a few people making legal decisions because when you're presenting information, you run into issues with the law, questions about defamation, all sorts of issues in foreign countries where they have bizarre ideas like a right to be forgotten or stuff like that. Uh, you just have to deal with with all that, uh, and you have to deal with cross cultural issues when you uh, when you have multiple languages and multiple separate com uh, communities managing those languages, but still one legal organization at the top of it all. I mean, it gets messy, and you eventually have to hire a few people to maintain servers to deal with with those legal issues, uh, and just perhaps recommends, uh, recompense people who end up spending most or almost all of their life uh, dealing with uh, with certain questions or issues or things things like that. 
Um, so yeah, a lot of structure grew around Wikipedia. Uh, I was involved in various parts of it. I knew various other inner circle people. Uh, and But around 2007, I was getting a little bit disenchanted by uh, basically for uh, for most of the time that I, uh, or for pretty much all the time that I was around, there was an anti-commercial idea in it. Uh, not, I mean, not, not against commerce, but against paid involvement, uh, paid participation in the project by external people. We, uh, meaning we were worried that a... Uh, a corporation or a government or uh, somebody with a lot of money would show up, donate a lot, and then use that to gain a certain type of editorial prominence or prominence for their preferred views on the project. Like, uh, nobody wanted that. And so we banned, uh, we never did advertisements uh, in Wikipedia. Uh, just out of concern for neutrality and the best quality content that we could get. But the problem is sites require money to run, and it's hard to continually gather that type of uh, funding from either government grants or, or even just reaching out directly to the masses of people saying, hey, would you please give 10 bucks for us to help us meet our, our bills? Uh, and so they started occasionally accepting larger donations and putting banner thank you ads, uh, or ban uh, banners that would say thank you to their donors. I thought this was inappropriate. I understand why they did it, but I felt that it stepped on uh, on red lines that as a community we really should have tried to uh, avoid. And and I, I realized that there's a cost to that, and there there is a danger in the project falling apart because it can't manage to pay the bills to house its servers. Um, I felt it was worth that risk for that principle. And But you, you see trade-offs of this sort happen all the time, both in corporations and in other nonprofits, where they, they have to decide what are the things that we want to remain absolutely fixed on and what are the things where we're willing to bend, and how much are we willing to bend? Um, you see cert authorities dealing with this uh, uh, on the internet, where, uh, or or you see big big tech companies that would like to, for example, do business in China, and there you have to deal with China's desire to censor uh, a whole lot of topics. And so what do you do? Do you bend to the Chinese government or do you deal with possibly being locked out of their market and not having your values realized there at all? Uh, or, uh, or possibly just giving up, on, uh, giving up on the financial possibilities there, the possibility for donors, etc. cetera. And, uh, and, and likewise, you, sometimes just governments are very direct in that they want certain opinions or even friendliness avoided, like, for example, to Taiwan. China is kind of nuts on that. And so you have to make choices, and they're not easy choices. You're going to, uh, given the, uh, given any organization, you're going to have some reasonable disagreements. I, I don't mean to deeply disrespect the people who weren't on the same uh, side of the issue as I was, but I also wanted to, to take that stance. And I did. I left the project. Um, actually, I think it was later than 2007. I don't quite remember when it was. I, I was user improv uh, on the encyclopedia. You, you can look it up. Um, there were a few other issues in the project, and there were some uh, there was at least one person in the project who I really, really didn't get along with. Um, and I, I felt, as several authors did, that uh, he was a major problem. Uh, but uh, what can you do? Uh, I mean, you're a, again, you're not going to like everybody. And also, people change. Maybe he's not the, the person that I remember him being when I met him in person uh, and interacted with him after I met him in person. Um, uh, and also, uh, just 
there there were a few political stances I took on Wikipedia that had nothing to do with me leaving, but uh, but they they were on spicy topics. But again, there were plenty of spicy topics, and on plenty of them I didn't care one way or the other. Uh, in my case, I was a deletionist. Uh, I think that it, it's it's appropriate to try not to cover uh, topics that have no historical significance. Generally, I, I felt that if you couldn't imagine somebody 50 or 100 years looking back and wanting to know a particular something, then it probably d doesn't belong in an uh, encyclopedia, and you're better off without having the people who are like super, super fascinated by some aspect of pop culture, or even something as boring as roads. Uh, you're probably better off not having that kind of stuff there and let them go off to a more specialized encyclopedia somewhere. Um, and so I, I felt that uh, building a notion of what is encyclopedic and what is not is something that I, I think is, is healthy. And I think it's also healthy then once you've built it to try and push uh, for that notion and to try and zap things that don't fit that notion. Um, or get them moved off to some more specialized space. Um, and I, I realize that this isn't about hard drive space at all, um, but it is to a certain extent about focus. Uh, and I, I think that you need a certain amount of focus around, around encyclopedic topics to build quality. Um, anyhow, uh, I, at this point, it's been a long time since I've been involved in Wikipedia. Uh, there are times when I miss it. There were a lot of good people that I knew. Um, but it also was very time consuming, and I've had a number of other projects. Plus, I've often had very consuming jobs that haven't left me a whole lot of uh, time outside of work. So it's, it's good to... I don't see myself going back anytime soon. There still is that kind of appeal to organize information. And if I ever get started on that, I probably would would get addicted again. Because it, it's the kind of thing that is addictive to people with a personality like mine. Um, but, uh, but it would be very consuming if I were to go back. And I probably don't want to... Uh, at least at this point, to consider doing that. Um, the, the thing that got me thinking about Wikipedia, maybe talking about it a little bit, is uh, I'm, I wanted to actually talk a little bit more about, uh, about politics, about what Trump has done in his, uh, in his time so far. And I'm, I'm going to use uh, a Wikipedia article. The article is titled First 100 Days of Donald Trump's Presidency. And each president, if I remember correctly, or, or, or at least most presidents on Wikipedia uh, that were recent, have an article like this. Um, for some reason in the United States, we see the first 100 days as being special. Uh, and I guess maybe those days are of a little bit more interest in that they they represent a transition from when uh, uh, from uh, from campaign mode to running things mode, and they usually will happen at a time when the incoming president is not kept particularly busy by the demands of the world, just by by luck, and there aren't like ongoing concerns that will gobble a lot of their time. And they're typically trying to make a big splash with their first 100 days as they seek to get a lot of their campaign promises out of the way. And we've seen some kind of interesting things happen in the uh, happen so far. Um, so going over this, uh, going over Wikipedia, uh, what it has right now in the uh, in there. The immediate regulatory freeze pending review, that's pretty normal. I think most presidents do that. Um, basically, you uh, 
you put a freeze on everything that was done last minute by the previous president, and you uh, you uh, you then review what they did and decide what goes forward and what doesn't. And so Trump did that. That that was actually one of the more standard things that he's done. Um, it is a it's a little bit unusual to see this. Uh, America first production push that's described uh, in in the article the notion that uh, departments would be rewarded if they um, if they try to use locally uh, like the word local is a little bit weird at a national level but use locally produced uh, goods to perform what they do that's odd it feels like it's against free trade in some ways which uh, is not something I'm ideologically worried about, but I find it uh, it's unusual for a Republican to be doing more than lip service to this, and it might be bad policy. Um, but but again, I'm, I'm not really sure about this. Isn't something I feel particularly strong. Uh, about it, it is unusual to see from a Republican. Um, the spending freeze at uh, several government uh, uh, agencies—that's kind of wor uh, worrying. But it's also probably not unusual for incoming presidents, again, while they review what uh, uh, while they review what those agencies are doing. Although it would be would have been kind of nice to have had the review starting even without access to the internal information uh, so that there, there was some indication as to what's going to happen after the freeze is done. The media blackout at government agencies is weird. Um, although part of this is just due to having one of the weirder things that that uh, that's Come about in uh, in politics from the Republican Party over the uh, in this last election and maybe the the previous election is this uh, cut everything mentality. Basically, uh, some there there have been people trying to do budget pledges and uh, and push for the the uh, the termination of entire government agencies over the last few years. This has struck me as uh, as bizarre. Basically, previously Republicans were just people who who were saying, "Hey, let's move slow, let's try to be cautious and not do things that'll get us in trouble long term. We'll be wary of any deep changes in society and in government," which can be frustrating for people who believe that there are standing injustices. Uh, these would always feel like the people who are dragging their feet on fixing things. But you could kind of justify that perspective on the notion that if you move too fast, you'll make a lot of mistakes, and some of them could be very damaging, uh, could be destabilizing, could damage cherished norms. So let's do them slowly and make sure that we talk about uh, things and think about them and possibly uh, revert things that were moving uh, too quickly that, uh, that don't seem to be working out right. Uh, that uh, that has given way uh, to trends in the Republican Party to uh, cut everything, or at least uh, dramatically uh, hack at government, and uh, until there's not uh, until there's nothing left. You, you could probably describe this as being libertarian entryism into the Republican Party that has been quite successful at isolating conservatives of the older style. And a lot, uh, a lot of the people that Trump has appointed have been of this flavor, who, uh, who before being appointed to Trump's cabinet, they were talking about cutting the very agency that Trump put them in charge of. And, uh, and so you would expect a certain amount of hostility from what I'm going to call such crazy ideas from the new boss, and so there were some uh, there there were some tweets that were uh, that 
went against the expected incoming policy of the Trump administration. There were also there's also just some areas where uh, either uh, Trump and the people surrounding him are denying reality, such as on climate change, or areas where Trump and the people around him had very strong views on social issues that have never yet been uh, had any official representation in government. And so you would expect a certain amount of hostility from career politicians in those areas who are being pushed to make big changes that are either crazy, uh, again, on climate change, or are radically different and probably unwise. Um, and so it's, it's hard to really say that uh, who's right or wrong in, uh, in some of these topics, like in areas where the Trump administration is just flat out denying uh, reality. I would like to see continual or c continued opposition to the priorities that, uh, that the Trump administration is trying to put in, like again on, on climate change. Scientists should continue to do research on the topic they should continue to try to act as a guide to what is true uh, based on existing ways that science works. And it doesn't really matter what people get elected. Uh, that's not the, the, the role of... We should, we should just say that the, the role of politicians is not to tell us what is true. Uh, the role of politicians might be to inject our, our values into what we do about what is true, but, uh, but science, at least on scientific topics, tells us what, uh, uh, what is true, or at least what is most likely to be true. Now, on the social issues, uh, I regret to see that, that mostly uh, liberals have lost, and there are some areas where I disagreed with what seemed to be the consensus being pushed by the Demo uh, Democratic Party, and maybe I'm not personally losing as much uh, by my values on those topics, or maybe I'm not losing anything at all and I'm actually gaining. But by and large, I would like to see the nanny state uh, thrive, and I'd like to see us keep working on perfecting it and improving it. And I'm deeply dis disappointed and worried to see uh, that stuff being peeled back. And, uh, but we lost, we have to deal with it. Uh, and I am not sure whether positive results can come about from departments that are attempting to resist that. Uh, the, the job of a department, uh, of a government department is probably not to be political and it shouldn't be to resist elected officials. Uh, and so we just have to deal with the executive branch being the uh, uh, the continuity between parts of the executive branch, which Trump now runs, being the way that power works in government. But we can certainly criticize that as private citizens, and we should when we disagree with it. And not all, not everybody's going to disagree with it. Uh, obviously, I mean there were. A lot of people who voted for Trump enough to get him elected, but uh, but it also doesn't mean like if a certain percentage of people vote for you and a certain percentage vote against you, usually that's going to be within the range of forty to sixty percent on both sides, uh, at least of the people voted uh, of the people who voted, and uh, and so that means that any president elected is going to have a sizable opposition to whatever they want to do. And, um, and so you should expect there can and will be some people who are very angry. There can and will be protests. And that's the way it goes. Uh, and we, we shouldn't be shy about expressing our views. But we also have to remember that protests are usually not a way to send a message to somebody else. They're a way to, uh, to remind ourselves that we're not alone on some issues. So you can have two competing protests that both fully do their job. They're, they're not sending messages. They're reminding everybody there that, hey, you're not alone in what you believe. And keep, keep pushing for it, keep talking about it, keep trying to build consensus so that the next time 
uh, there's an election, you win. Even if you're in power now, you want to stay in power. And if you're not in power, you want to become in power. Uh, and you'd like to see your, your policies, uh, your preferred policies, or at least the best policies that you can possibly get by your values, uh, turn into government policies. Um, anyhow, uh, moving on, the so there was a tax break for um, for mortgage in insurance premiums that uh, wasn't renewed uh, um, by Trump by the Federal Housing Administration. I just thought that this was a weird move. I, I don't see what benefit Trump got from doing it. I don't have a particularly strong opinion on it. Uh, I mean, maybe you could try and argue that I should, but uh, but I mean, we could all uh, whatever arguments we uh, we choose to apply there, we could imagine they could apply to reducing any tax uh, any tax or or any cost in society to zero. And the fact that we could do so at the cost of uh, pushing up uh, spending elsewhere uh, doesn't mean that we necessarily should. Was that the best way to spend? Uh, whatever uh, tax dollars were involved, um, I'm not sure. So I, I don't have particularly strong uh, views on that. Um, I'm not sure why uh, Trump chose to do it. Uh, the withdrawal from the uh, from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I see as a positive thing. Uh, I I absolutely loathed the intellectual property provisions in that, and. I, I don't want to see the growth of intellectual property uh, protections. And so anywhere that they happen, uh, basically, if you include growth of intellectual properties uh, bundled into anything, uh, you probably have either lost my vote or have seriously diminished my enthusiasm for whatever it is. And they were there. As a result, I didn't like the TPP, and I'm happy to see it gone even if it was done for reasons that were largely unrelated to why I wanted it done. Um, as for the Mexico City policy, uh, this was a, um, a choice by, tr uh, by Trump to not offer foreign aid uh, to non-government organizations that, uh, that teach about or fund uh, abortions. Uh, and, and I think that this is unfortunate, uh, deeply unfortunate, and that these these uh, policies, these NGOs, they were doing the world some good. Uh, they were uh, advocating for use of, of condoms, contraceptives, and abortion. Um, in uh, in other uh, other nations for people who uh, for people in families that weren't ready to raise more kids um, and generally when somebody isn't ready we can believe that they're probably not going to be the the best parent uh, and if they don't want to do it uh, if they don't want to to give uh, to give birth then it's probably in everybody's interests in that society that they not give birth and uh, I, I have to say that on abortion, I don't see it as being a morally significant act. It's not something I'm trying to minimize in any way, uh, except possibly uh, for late trimester um, abortions, where I see it as being a bit more complicated, uh, complicated of an issue. But those are such a slim percentage of abortions that it's not worth focusing on or worrying about the, uh, 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 compared to the much more common abortions that are happening in the first trimester. Uh, and there, there's no, brain uh, no significant brain development of the fetus, so it might as well be a toenail. And uh, I, now this doesn't necessarily mean that I, th uh, that I think that that the, uh, that the foreign funding to those NGOs was always well spent, but just if you're going to focus, if you're going to use uh, uh, abortion as being a divider for when you provide funds versus when you, when you don't, that just seems to me uh, unwise, and you're cutting off some of the most useful type of aid that you could give. Whether you should be giving aid in the first place uh, and when, 
I don't know. But just don't don't give up on the good stuff. Don't give up on the uh, on the getting rid of the worst beginning uh, of a, of a family uh, that you could possibly be uh, be giving up on. Uh, on it's better that that people uh, wait to have families for when they're ready, when they're old enough, when they're financially uh, established enough. And there's uh, I I just feel that this was a little bit of red meat to offer to the religious uh, right in the United States that have always been deeply suspicious of people having sex outside of marriage. Um, I mean, there are some people who aren't so worried about that, uh, who are who just find uh, abortion morally abhorrent. I guess I can understand that. It's not a position that I share. But I can see why they don't want to pay for it. Um, but it's, it's not a position that I share. And I... Uh, naturally, I'm going to push for policies that fit my views, uh, even when I can understand the uh, the views of others. As for the government-wide hiring freeze, I can see why Trump uh, why, why Trump did it. Again, there's some of that pretending to be a budget hawk uh, thing combined with uh, restructuring that happens as part of. Uh, part of an, uh, a transition of power. We'll have to see what that looks like as the departments get new heads and uh, what the uh, hiring freeze lifts uh, look like, presuming that there are lifts. Um, it, it'll be hard to know what, uh, what, that, uh, what the impact of that will be until we see the longer term. As for the Dakota Access and Keystone um, pipelines, I don't know a lot about that issue, um, and not knowing a lot, I'm not going to take a strong position on it. I understand that we have energy needs, and petrol is one way to meet certain kinds of those energy needs. Um, there might be environmental concerns with the particular way that this uh, that this pipeline is done, although. To be fair, there are always, uh, or almost always, environmental concerns. And if you name a project, there will, uh, somebody will spring out of the um, out of the weeds to oppose it and tell you why you shouldn't do it. Uh, and I don't know enough on this particular issue whether this is something that reasonable people should be worried about or not. And so. Uh, I will just refrain from saying anything further on that since I can't say anything further useful on that. Um, on uh, on expediting uh, environmental reviews for infrastructure, uh, I am a little bit worried about, about that. I guess I would be willing to buy, maybe, that there could be excessive concern uh, or excessive weight given to very small groups that would uh, that would block a number of useful construction projects uh, uh, like national construction projects but I but I'm not sure whether that's actually the case uh, I'm not sure whether the general public knows uh, whether that's the case either and it might be the case of liberals are assuming that oh these are really terrible uh, environmental infringements and it's important to prevent them, whereas conservatives might think, oh, it's some Yahoo out on a reservation who has some kind of spiritual concerns for uh, some pipelines being laid near some sacred lands or other such nonsense. And both sides will probably be assuming the worst uh, of the other. Uh, and uh, I'm, I guess it would take some more study as to what what actually is is being tugged on uh, to know whether the uh, environmental reviews are sane or not, and so whether uh, Trump's pullback of them are uh, is sane or not. For the Mexican border wall, I think I probably have talked about this in previous videos. I don't think it's uh, immoral in any way to have a wall. Uh, I just think that it is a terrible use of funds. Um, that most of the 
people who are illegally present in the United States uh, are not people who snuck across the border. They're people who came temporarily and then never left. And a wall won't help with them. And so what's the point? Why, if you're going to be a budget hawk, why spend so much money on something that won't really reasonably serve any of your ends? Uh, and again, I don't think that they're unreasonable end. I, I really, if we had a magic way to just have everybody, as soon as they stepped across the border illegally, to just poof, disappear and reappear back in their country of origin uh, where they were born uh, or, or wherever they're a national of, I think that'd be fine. I think I'd, I'd probably do it uh, if, if we had the way, uh, the way to do that. I think as a nation, we should be able to decide who comes in and who doesn't and not be worried about any concerns that might say, oh, you have to let them in for one reason or another. You can, you can ignore all that. It's, uh, a nation should be able to make that choice. There are not really any overriding concerns there. But the issue is the wall doesn't do that. It, it really, it's a useless gesture that I think is just showy and made to be red meat to people. It's a symbol and you're spending a whole lot on a symbol, uh, a lot, whole lot more than is reasonable. But I guess he's going to do it. He's going to waste that money and not spend that money on something that's more productive. Um, and that's unfortunate, uh, just because it's a waste. Um, for deport, uh, deportations of, un, uh, of illegal immigrants, um, and again, I really don't believe in the undocumented language. I think that, uh, that that feels like linguistic revisionism. It's an ugly project that the left really needs to stop doing. Uh, but for illegal immigrants, um, I'm not bothered. I, I don't think that there's any moral obligation to let them stay. But at the same time, we gain a lot from having at least some of them here. Uh, they're part of the labor force. Some of them are, are willing to serve in the military. Uh, so, um, and even though we shouldn't necessarily, uh, the, the labor force argument is complicated, uh, particularly as a socialist, I'm concerned about the loss of the ability to negotiate for wages when large supplies of workers uh, can come in, uh, can step across the border, who would be very happy to have, uh, have wages that are much lower than what unions are trying to negotiate for. I would rather have the unions have some leverage than have a, readily, a ready supply of desperate labor. But, uh, but again, that, that isn't, uh, that, that's not who all the uh, illegal aliens are. And I think, I think it's, I think the dream, uh, the dream program that Obama was was pushing struck a decent balance on this uh, on the on this topic. Maybe balance is the wrong word because it, I don't want to buy into this idea that whenever there's uh, a policy question, you always try and find the middle. I, I disagree there, but I, I feel that the that the dream program it's attempted to get good value out of the questions that we're faced with as a nation. And while I, I think that the liberals have often gotten the, the details wrong on immigration, like the notion that like if one, if one person comes into the United States uh, or, or was born in the United States, then they can serve uh, through family reunification policies as a way to get the rest of their uh, their family in. Um, I, uh, uh, particularly if they entered uh, illegally as a group, I don't think that that's good policy. I actually uh, also don't think that uh, that birthright citizenship is quite the right thing. And And if in particular, I, I think that it would be fine to decide that if neither parent is a citizen, then the child shouldn't uh, shouldn't get citizenship, 
just based on on being uh, uh, on being born on this soil. I think most European nations, actually most of the rest of the world, doesn't have birthright citizenship. Not that, that necessarily means that we shouldn't, but we shouldn't be shy about uh, the possibility of uh, of getting rid of it, and it gets rid of some incentive problems. And I think in general we need to be thinking about uh, we need to think about incentives and how people navigate our system when we're building it so that we don't provide a system that's easy to gain. And I feel that birthright citizenship is fairly easy to gain. If you are in another country and you decide, well, I may not have the legal right to get to the United States myself, but I have a kid and I would like for them to, uh, or I, I'm pregnant, uh, or uh, and I would like to have my child have American citizenship. I'll slip across the border or get a temporary immigration uh, status so that I can make sure I give birth in the United States. Uh, and that way they'll be a citizen. Uh, and uh, that feels problematic. And then to go further and say, well, they're a U.S. citizen. They shouldn't have to leave. I may be forced to leave but it would be cruel to break up my family. So therefore you should let me stay too. I think that that's even more problematic. So if you just get rid of the birthright citizenship when neither parent is a citizen, you solve the problem neatly. And I think that in general, we need to think about how laws will be used when we're setting them up. And, I, and so I, I would be in favor of revising birthright citizenship to require one parent to be uh, a citizen in order for the child to be a citizen. Doesn't mean that I think that it should be impossible for people to, uh, to become citizens though. Um, just that if there is a pipeline, no matter how slow or inefficient uh, it is, it should, uh, it should attempt to be fair. Uh, it, if there's a lottery, then you make people go through it. You don't provide sneaky workarounds for people to dodge that line. And there's no obligation for it to be easy. And if somebody doesn't, uh, doesn't find it easy, that can't justify them trying to find ways to slip around the line. Um, for, refu for the recent stuff on refu uh, refu uh, bleh, refugees and immigrants, uh, Trump suspended uh, the refugee admi uh, admissions program for uh, entry into the United States, uh, and uh, and this is for uh, people who are uh, who are citizens of Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Iran, and Iraq. I think that they got the list wrong. First off. Uh, at least for Iran, uh, Iran is not a nation that is undergoing the kind of uh, dangerous uh, militancy that happens inside failed states. So it just makes no sense at all to me to have such limitations on, on Iran. It's admittedly not a country that we're particularly friendly with. I, would, I personally would love for us to try to be more friendly with it. Um, that is made difficult by it having a fairly repressive government, but it's also a reasonably democratic government. They have unpredictable transfers of power that are based on electoral vote. It's not full transfers of government from uh, of all institutions. Some are less democratic than others, but that's also true of ours. Our judges, uh, they rotate infrequently. Um, so, I mean, no government is either fully democratic or fully not democratic, but Iran, they have little to do with the other nations on that list. As for suspending the refugee admissions program, I don't think that we should consider ourselves to have any obligation to let any refugees in whatsoever. It's not our responsibility. It's not something that we should feel we have to do. Um, I realize that there are some uh, some ideas in international treaties that suggest uh, otherwise, but that uh, but I'm talking about what I think is a good idea or not, and we can always shift our participation in those treaties. 
but I think any nation has pretty much a near absolute prerogative to decide who it wants to let in for whatever reason, apart from things that uh, that are designed to create ethnic homelands, which I, I think would be an exception and no nation should be permitted to do that. Um, but so so looking at this uh, at this list and thinking about it, a it is focusing on areas of the world where there is uh, most of those nations are either failed states or close to them, uh, and there's a lot of active militancy in them, and there are concerns uh, apparently about people coming in from those nations to the United States who might still be militant. And as far as I understand, this is actually quite rare that somebody would come in uh, from, from those nations who is a militant. It's, it's happened very, very rarely from what, uh, from what research I've done on the topic. And I'm not the most knowledgeable person on this particular topic. I've done some research. I haven't decided to make myself an expert on it. Um, or, or even like a citizen expert, like somebody who's studied it a lot. Um, but as far as I understand, it's just, it is a concern for something that almost never happens. I would be happier if we were doing this policy for better reasons than concerns about uh, terrorism from those refugees. If we just decided, you know, for cultural reasons, we're not going to do that, I think that's fine. Uh, doesn't bother me. Again, I don't think that there should be considered an obligation to let uh, let anybody in, or to, to let particular groups in, or even to try and be fair to particular groups. But it's bad policy when your stated goal to do something has nothing to do with the effects that uh, uh, the effects of your policies. Um, you should uh, you. And the, the public reason that you're doing it needs to be pretty decently tied to the results that you're going to get. And there's just no, the problem that they're trying to attack isn't a real problem. Um, if they were describing a, a different real problem, and they, uh, then, yeah, maybe this policy might make sense for that. The other issue with this, though, is that... It, if you're attempting to achieve things in the in the international sphere, and we are, we were trying to deal with uh, deal with ISIS uh, to lessen their influence to eventually uh, destroy them, uh, and we have a whole bunch of trade and other interests in uh, uh, in the world. This type of policy is damages the relationships that are some of our tools for, for achieving our ends. Um, and I, I think that it's not, it, we should at least be very reluctant to use tools like this uh, because, because we're cutting off other tools that are very important to do what we want to get done. So I, I don't think I, 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 I would do this, certainly not for the reason that's presented, which is absolute nonsense, but, but I would even be wary of doing it for other reasons. Uh, I, I wouldn't rule it out entirely, but, uh, but I, I, just, I don't think it's good policy. I think it's kind of dangerous to be doing this. Um, and, it, and this is also true in general. Like, one of the issues that I see with the Trump presidency is that the United States has spent a very long time building political and economic capital. And those are power. They're a soft form of power. Uh, but other nations very often will do things the way that we would like them to be done based on the established uh, norms that we've put forth. And if we decide to give up on those norms for the sake of shorter-term benefit, yes, we will get a short-term benefit, uh, you, provided that you even do that part right. But yeah, you can get short-term benefit by being much pushier in negotiations. But the problem is that 
ends up spending a whole lot of that capital that is the foundation for uh, an American-dominated political and, e and economic order. And if you would like to have that, and presumably even if you're an American nationalist, you would like to, to have that, uh, be far-sighted enough to realize what you're giving up uh, when you decide to spend a whole lot of that capital. You lose out on a whole lot of things that were just silently going your way that you want people to depend on going your way. Uh, when you when you spend the capital and so it, it's really it's a, a very short-term focused approach to things that uh, that you just you shouldn't do strategies like that they're they're dumb and so that's what I've seen so far in Trump I mean there's still there's still the enormously worrying way that he approaches issues uh, and the hypersensitivity to criticism. I mean, you'd almost think that he's some social justice warrior or something like that and how, uh, how desperate he is to be offended, uh, how fragile his views are. Uh, and... And that's not somebody who you should want to be your leader. And so, yeah, I, I just, I, I think that this, what we've seen so far from his policies, from the people he's uh, appointed, um, from how he's acted in office, they combine the worst aspects of somebody who's totally incompetent so, uh, somebody who's putting showmanship above good policy, somebody who doesn't understand the world, has no intellectual curiosity, um, and who's willing to offer red meat uh, rather than uh, decent policy. He's, uh, it's bizarre to see us going from a technocratic, long-thinking, uh, deep-thinking president to... Uh, to a used car salesman that, uh, that uh, well, that's very likely to be almost entirely negative, even, even to more realistic conservatives. And we're seeing conservatives uh, of various types, like Bill Kristol, um, argue, uh, argue against a lot of the demagoguery that, uh, that Trump is doing. You don't have to like Bill Kristol's views. You don't have to like the various other conservatives who are worried uh, about these views. You don't have to work. Uh, you don't have to like John McCain to to see that there are plenty of conservatives who are very anti-torture. Um, some of uh, some of whom, like McCain, have suffered torture, and they know that uh, it it demeans us as a nation to do uh, to do these things. Um, and, but I, I guess it, it'll be interesting and unfortunate to watch this, uh, this go on. Um, anyhow, that's enough about Trump, and I am trying to keep these under an hour, so I'll briefly talk about a few other things that, uh, that I've been doing. I've, uh, I've had a few games that I've been enjoying. Uh, as I mentioned, I think in the last... Uh, in my last entry, Disgaea 2 for PC is coming out, I think, in two days. I've been enjoying a game called uh, Shantae the Half-Genie Hero. Um, like a lot of other games that, uh, that I really get into, it has excellent music. And it's, just, it's basically one of the best platforming experiences that, that you could hope for. The controls are really tight, super res uh, responsive. Um, the gameplay mechanics are interestingly varied. Uh, there's the return to past areas. There's a little bit of, uh, of an economic system. There's up, uh, upgrades. Uh, but in general, it's just a joy to play as you, uh, as you move through the world and keep on gaining new powers that remove annoyances uh, or toughness that you got to struggle f uh, through a few times. And that's fun. Uh, I mean, there is a certain frustration with dealing with the really tough parts of the game, 
But that just makes it all the more satisfying when you go through it uh, later on and have some new abilities or items that make everything easier. And there's also just good characterization. It's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I've uh, still uh, often going back to, uh, to Binding of Isaac and Fallout 4. Both of them are fun in different ways. Um, Fallout 4 is just great at atmospherically, and it's neat to keep building stuff and feel like you're you're improving uh, improving the world uh, the uh, the world that your character lives in. Um, I've also probably almost every weekend, if not every weekend, I've been uh, going to a local dosa place to enjoy some nice avocado dosas. Um, uh, places called Hampton Chutney. There's a few of them in Manhattan, and I'm just kind of nuts about uh, avocados. And it's yeah, it's it's just nice to have a place that, that's solidly uh, good and interesting doses. I'm not sure if I could ever learn to make decent doses on my own. I should probably try it, um, but they they seem like a lot of work. But it, it's it's worth spending time trying to. Uh, uh, trying to, to learn new skills. I've been spending a little bit more time recently uh, pulling some of the works of fiction that I used to be uh, used to do um, back uh, back out of uh, out of my history and into something that I actually spend time on. Um, the uh, the Oish Listen Oish Listen comic that I did. Uh, I have a few new. Um, I have a few new entries that I've done, and I guess maybe when I have enough, I'll actually start coloring them and sca uh, scanning them somehow and and consider reopening that series. Uh, I, I liked doing that comic particularly because there's not a lot of plot that I need to worry about. It's largely about exploring ideas. Uh, and it's exploring ideas on some topics that are of uh, uh, personal meaning to me. Uh, the tougher comics uh, that I was working on were really more stories that happened to be expressed in comic form. Uh, Mustard and Exodus were the two ones that I spent the most time on and which I might have shared uh, to some people a little bit more broadly some time back. They're a lot of work, um, like building that world I enjoyed building the world and figuring out what happened, but actually turning that into short expressions that still tried to convey a lot of time in the lives of the protagonists, that was much tougher. Like making it either punchy or really move move the dialogue uh, or move the state of the world along. That was tough. I hope to keep working on that, but I'm not sure. I might actually have to get like many chapters, I probably want to just restart those when I uh, when I have them far enough along. But I, I really enjoyed working on those because the longer story arcs and the worlds that they lived in, they let me talk more about various issues and explore various ideas. Um, I think that's it for now. Uh, I eventually will want to get uh, try to get back into sketching and doing art, uh, artsy things, but it's hard to do that given the space I have in a Manhattan uh, apartment. I'm trying to reorganize the apartment a little bit to give me a little bit uh, to give me a little bit more room, but uh, that's not exactly easy. There's only so much space to work with. Anyhow, uh, that's it uh, for now. I will probably do another one of these in not too long. Uh, take care.